everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm Zach Hancock, an evolutionary biologist who specializes in population genetics. For regular viewers, you will notice that I am not in my normal setting. This is not a bookshelf behind me. Um, this is a whiteboard. Um, because what we're going to do is something very special today. Many of you are probably aware that recently myself and Dr. Dan Starn Cardinal from Creation Myths published a paper in the Journal of Mathematical Biology titled Back to the Fundamentals. And it is a direct response to a paper that was published in 2018 by Bill Basner and John Sanford. This is John Sanford of Genetic Entropy fame. We have done many videos on genetic entropy on this channel. Um, I will have linked them in the description below. You can check them out. On April 24th, Dan and I are going to do a lit review of these two papers. Um, but one of the things that I was thinking about leading up to this lit review is I've gotten a lot of comments, a lot of emails uh, on people being confused and a little bogged down about the math. Um, so both of these papers are highly mathematical and it's quite difficult to get into like nitty gritty details in a live stream. So what I wanted to do is sort of put out a video before the live stream comes out introducing you to these mathematical ideas, walking through their derivations in detail so that you will be fully on board and understanding where we're coming from when we start making statements in the, in the lit review section in which, again, we're not going to completely go through the math, we're just going to make kind of broad sweeping statements. Okay, so um, one of the things to note really sort of quickly in introduction is that both the Basner and Sanford paper and uh, our response paper are heavily focused on the concept of Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural selection. Um, many people, uh, many, of, many viewers are probably not aware what that is exactly. Um, so to understand it, let's go, let's actually go all the way back to Darwin, okay? So one of the Darwin's arguments for natural selection was that there has to be variation in individuals that is heritable for fitness. Okay, so some individuals leave more offspring than others, and their ability to do that is because they possess some variant that is more fit than variants possessed by other individuals. So, natural selection relies on there being variation in fitness among individuals. Right? That's a basic truism and a basic tenet of natural selection. What Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural selection does is it takes that concept and it applies it mathematically. And when you do that, what you actually find is that the rate of change of fitness is equal to how much, fit, how much variation there is in fitness at that time. So let's write this out mathematically. So, we're going to write Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural selection. Okay? Fisher's fundamental theorem is equal to the rate of change in mean population fitness. This, anytime you see this triangle, this is for the Greek letter delta. That's the, cha that's the change, the rate of change in W, which is traditionally the, the letter for fitness. And then the bar over it signifies that it's a mean. Okay? So the rate of change in mean fitness is equal to V sub A, this is the variance in fitness, and this is technically the additive genetic variance in fitness. We'll explain exactly what that means. Divided by mean population fitness plus delta bar. Delta bar is the deviation in the fitness values between parents and offspring. That is to say, you, we don't expect parents and offspring to have identical fitnesses. Something usually happens that make them deviate a bit. This is mutation, recombination, etc. Right? Um, this is Fisher's fundamental theorem. Now, Fisher, importantly, was only concerned with the component of this fitness change that was due to natural selection. Now, we just stated that this term is due to mutation, recombination, and other such effects. Right? So, traditionally, Fisher's theorem is just written like this. That the rate of change in mean population fitness is equal to the additive genetic variance in fitness at any point in time. Okay? That's the mathematical statement of Fisher's fundamental theorem. Now, the question for us here today um, is, how do you get that? Right? How do we get to this point? Um, what kind of assumptions did we have to make to get to this point? Because a key 
criticism from Basiner and Sanford that we try to respond to is that Fisher's fundamental theorem was derived under a lot of simplifying assumptions that limit its generality, right? That a theorem is not really a theorem if it makes a ton of simplifying assumptions, right? You, you want it to be a general theorem of nature. What I'm going to argue, what we argued in the paper, and what I'm going to argue here today, is that this is a general theorem of nature that makes no simplifying assumptions. That's what I'm here to prove to you today, and we're going to do that mathematically. Now the first thing that we are going to do, instead of diving straight into math, is we're going to diagram out how we think evolution actually works, okay? Um, as opposed to like starting with a bunch of simplifying assumptions, we're going to start off with sort of a diagram of evolution, okay? So in any sort of evolutionary process, you have ancestors and you have descendants, right? Now, this doesn't necessarily have to be parent and offspring. It can be ancestors many, many generations ago and descendants that, uh, you know, that extend from a long line of descent from them, and you're measuring these two distinct time points, right? Um, but fundamentally, evolution is the change in trait values, which can be change in alleles, genotypes, phenotypes, whatever it may be. It's change in some measurable, heritable trait between ancestors and descendants. That's evolution. Right? So can we show that in a diagram, and then we can represent that diagram mathematically? So let's start out with some ancestors. This, whenever you see these three little dots, that just means there's a bunch of individuals between these. We're just not going to draw them all out, okay? Um, starting from individual 1, 2, all the way to individual n, okay? Now, we will often index these showing these values, i and j. I'll tell you what j is in a moment. i is 1, 2, all the way to n. Okay? So i is off, it's going to be used to represent the ancestral index. And I, this, that will become clear in a moment. Just stick with me. I promise we'll make that clear. Now, the next thing is that each of these ancestors have some kind of trait. And again, this can be any trait. It can be an allele, a genotype, it can be basal metabolic rate, limb proportions, whatever. Just any kind of trait that can be passed on to descendants. And we're going to represent that trait by the Greek letter phi. Okay? And this is phi of individual one. All right? So this is, this is where this indexing is coming from, right? So anytime you see a subscript that's telling you, that's an index telling you that this trait value belongs to individual one, okay? Same thing here, this is the trait value for individual two. This is the trait value for individual n, where n is the last individual in the population, okay? So notice we've made our first assumption. It's a finite population, okay? This is not an infinite population. Now, we think that's true for all biological systems, right? Um, and I, I would contend uh, and what I hope this actually proves to you is that any system that evolves, whether it's biological, whether it's a system uh, that evolved on another planet in a, another galaxy, doesn't matter, this is the way it would be represented. That there is no such thing as an infinite population that evolves. I, th I think we all accept that. I think that's an axiomatic truth. Right? Okay, so these are our ancestors. Okay, that's the ancestral generation right there. Okay, now all of these ancestors also have a mean trait value. And we can write that as phi bar, right? That's the mean of all the ancestral traits is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n. All right, let's, let's walk through what that means. So with th this is a summation term, and it is telling us to add up all, everything from the first individual, whatever that value might be, whatever this value might be, all the way to the last individual. Phi sub i. Okay? So, add them all up. That's to say individual with index i, where i starts off at 1, then add that to individual 2, individual 3, all the way to individual n. Okay? Then, we divide this by the total size of the population. And that 
is the mean trait value for phi. Okay. Uh, we can also write this, and what might help out and be a little bit clearer later, is we can write this like this. Okay. When you multiply um, the deno uh, denominator with a, with a numerator of 1 into, because you can also think about this like that, right? then this just goes into the numerator. Right? So those, the two things I just showed you are equivalent. This is the mean value of this trait. Okay? Again, this, that's the average. Um, so kind of keep this in mind. It's going to come up. It's going to come up a little later, and I'll remind us as we get there. Okay. So again, the ancestors have some mean trait value. Now these ancestors, to be ancestors, have to have descendants, right? Descendant index will be j from one to all the way to n. Okay. And we can draw them. So we have. Something like this, and this is now an, uh, descendant one two. This is descendant uh, one one, and I'll, I'll, that'll make sense in a moment. Don't worry. Okay, so this individual descends from here. This one descends from here. This one descends from here. Okay. This descendant inherits this trait, so we rewrite phi sub one. For the trait that it inherited, plus plus delta one one. What this delta term represents is the deviation in this descendant trait value relative to its ancestor trait value. So, if we want to say what is the trait value, so trait trait value of descendant 1 is equal to phi sub 1 plus delta 1, 1. Okay? That's the trait value of individual 1 because they got their trait from their ancestor, but they also had a mutation or a combination, something to make that trait value a little bit different than its ancestors. Okay? So, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to represent that for all of the descendants. All right, and now we just do the same thing with the second one. So that's phi sub 1 plus delta sub 1, 2. Okay, so now, again, that's still from ancestor 1, but we now have descendant number 2. Plus delta sub 2, 1. Now, this is from ancestor 2, descendant 1, all the way out to delta sub n, one. Okay, so those are the trait values now of all of our descendants. So these are descendants. Okay, those are all of our descendant generations. And the last thing that we need to know is fitness. Okay, we need to define fitness. So the fitness of individual one. So W sub 1 is simply equal to the number of offspring they have. In this case, it's 2. For this one, there's only one offspring for, fit for individual 2, and all the way up to individual N, who also only has one offspring. Okay? So notice there's a couple more things here. There's also a mean of fitness, right? So there is some, some value that we can write as W sub bar is equal to, just as before, the summation from i equals 1 to n of W sub i, right? Where that is, again, just telling us to add up all those values, all the way from the first individual to the last individual there, okay? That's the mean of fitness. And then there's also a mean here that we can write as phi bar prime. This phi bar prime is the mean of the descendants. Now, importantly, this mean of the descendants is the deviation uh, from ancestor to descendants in their trait value. Okay? And now, what we want to do is we want to write out the expression that captures this. And to do that, we actually have to make a couple of summations. Right? Because we need to know 
One, what is the trait values? What are the sums of the deviations as well as the fitnesses? All, we need all of that information to be able to get the mean of the descendant. So what we're going to do is I'm going to erase this, uh, screenshot it, refer back to it, draw it out, whatever you need, and then you can return to this to make sense of the following math that we're going to do. So let's erase this now. And then we're going to derive what we really care about, which is evolution. And evolution here is the change from descendants relative to their ancestors. Okay? So there is so this delta phi bar tells us how much evolution has occurred. That's the difference between these two, and that difference is the evolution that has happened. All right? So, how can we get that? Well, first we need to derive delta phi bar. And it's just a series of summations. First summation, we will write in here, is j to 1, or j equals 1 to w sub i. Now remember, j's are for descendants, i's are for ancestors, of phi sub i plus delta sub i j, okay? So all this is telling us to do is take the trait values from individual i, which is either 1, 2, all the way to n, and sum them with the deviation from i to j, where j is 1, 2, all the way to n, right, for individual i. So I'm just going to draw this out again to make this clear. So let's say there's 1, 2, 3, this is j, uh, k, l, these are the, the values, right? So all we're saying is for this individual, sum for that, okay? Sum up those values. That's all that this is telling us to do. And then we want to do this for all descendants, right? Not just the descendants of individual i, but if we want to get the mean trait value in the whole population, we need to sum this over all ancestors and their descendants. So we have to have a second summation term out, outside of that, which is i equals 1 to n. Okay? So again, all that's telling us to do is first sum up all of the values of the descendants for every ancestor. Right? That's all that is telling us to do. Now, since we want this to be a mean, we then need to divide this by the total population, right? And so to do that, we write this as dividing by the summation from i equals 1 to n of w sub i, right? Well, this is saying take the fitness of every single individual in the population, sum them up all the way to n, and that gives you the new population size, right? Because you can have a difference in population size between ancestors and descendants. So you can't just take n, because n is the population size of the ancestor. Right? So we need a sum across all the fitnesses of uh, ancestors and descendants to get the new, potentially new, population size. Okay, this expression will then give us the mean trait value in the next generation. Pretty cool, right? And so if we, we can do that and get this very simply. But what we want to do is actually recognize some identities within this expression. So there's a couple of really neat identities here that can kind of help us clarify what we're looking at. Okay? So first off, first things first, let's sort of break this down and simplify it out uh, into a little bit more of a manageable expression. So let's think about this summation into this first term. We're going to write the summation from j equals 1 to w sub i of phi sub i. That's the first term, okay? What is, what does this first term represent? Well, what it's telling us to do is take the trait value uh, of individual i and sum it for each offspring. So let's say individual i has three offspring, um, and obviously, and let's say that the, that trait value is uh, two, doesn't really matter, let's say it's, let's say it's two, 2 plus 2 plus 2 equals 6, okay, right? 
That's, the, that's what the summation would represent if each of those trait values, the trait value is exactly the same in the ancestor, right? But notice something else. Notice what this also represents is simply the number of individuals multiplied by the trait value, right? So if we just said three times two is also six. Well, what is this three? Well, the three is fitness because the individual has three offspring. So if you just take that individual's fitness, fitness multiplied by that individual's trait value, and you've taken the summation and written it a little bit more simply, right? So these two terms are equivalent to each other, right? So that's the first thing that we want to recognize is that this is just equal to this, okay? I'm going to write that over here just so that we can keep track of it because what we're going to do is we're going to do a lot of this kind of like simplifying. We're going to do a lot of this simplifying and I promise you it's going to make, it's going to make this whole thing a lot more digestible. Now let's do the same thing for that term. Right? So we've got summation from j equals 1 to w sub i. Now, of delta sub i j. Now, since the deltas amongst the uh, descendants are different between each individual, now we can have something like 1 plus 2 plus 3. Okay, again, that's equal to 6, right? But they're different terms from each other. Okay, so how can we write this in a similar way as we did previously? Well, notice something interesting here. If you take the fitness, which is 3, and then you simply multiply that by the mean of this, which is 1 plus 2 plus 3 divided by 3, right? That then equals 3 times 6 over 3, which is equal to 6. Right? Because this is 2, 3 times 2 is 6. Right? So, now instead of writing it like this, which is a simple product, we can write the same thing as w sub i multiplied by the mean of the deviation between i and j. Right? So we've just converted this deviation to a mean to get the equivalence. Okay? So, again, now we have another simple way of writing going from this sort of cumbersome term to something very simple. It's just a simple product. Right? So again, I'm going to write this over here just so that we can keep track for your edification, we'll write that W sub I delta bar IJ, okay? The last one, uh, so that's, that's those two there. Now let's do the same thing for this bottom one. So this bottom one here is the summation from I equals 1 to N multiplied by W sub I. Just like before, this W sub I is different across all individuals, from individual 1 to n. Right? And this is the difference in fitness, right? So the terms aren't the same. So again, let's say n, let's say n is equal to 3, just like before, 1 plus 2 plus 3 equals 6. That fitness of individual 1 is 1, fitness of individual 2 is 2, fitness of individual 3 is 3, total is equal to 6. Right? That's now the new population size, right? Okay, well, and that would be what we were doing if we were just summing across. Just like before, very simply. We know that if we take the fitness, multiply it by, or we take the population size, multiply it by the mean of the fitness, right? That gives us the same thing. So we're getting the exact same value, just like we did over here. So then we can just take this n, bring it down, and show that n multiplied by w bar is equivalent to this term. So once again, we have now simplified, we'll write it here, to 1 to n of w sub i is simply equal to n times w bar. Okay? All right, now let's, let's see how that impacts our expression. Let's see how it simplifies this beast into something that is going to look a little bit more manageable. Okay? So all this is now, now that we've done this, is equal to 1 over n w bar 
I, bear with me, bear with me, multiplied by uh, the sum from i equals 1 to n of w sub i phi sub i plus the sum of w sub i delta bar sub i j. Okay? That's the new expression that we just, that we just simplified. Right? Again, all we've done is we've taken this here, which is n w bar, we've just kind of moved it over here. It's the same thing. We've just taken this and we've just moved it up here. Right? So 1 over n w bar is then equal to, we have, we have to keep the outside summation, we've just simplified the inside summations as these two terms. So that's a little bit simpler, a little bit more manageable. Um, now, hopefully from earlier, you've, represent, you're, you've recognized something else, right? Is that we have a 1 over n, where n is the total population size, in front of two summation terms that include terms that we want the means of, right? So to make this clear, uh, just to write this down, like x bar, so the mean of x is 1 on n times the summation from i equals 1 to n of x of i. That's a mean, right? Again, that's an average value. So we should see this is clearly present in these two terms, which means we can write these terms as means, right? So let's actually simplify this even further by recognizing that these are mean values. So we're going to write this as equal to 1 on w bar. Now, the n is still going to be present, but it's going to be captured into these means. 1 on w bar over, now we have w phi mean plus w delta bar mean. Okay? So now we've simplified it from this to something even more simple. Right? Where now you have these two means multiplied by one on mean population fitness. Okay. We're going to need a little bit more room to do the next thing. So the next thing that we're going to show um, we're going to have to introduce a couple of terminologies that you may or may not be familiar with. Don't worry if you're not. I'm going to walk you through it. So the next thing that we need to understand to progress any further in this is the definition of covariance. Covariance. What is covariance? Well, a covariance, if we think about sort of an xy plane, and let's say this is the trait, this is fitness, right? A covariance, and these are, let's say those are our points, this is telling us that for every increase in the trait value, you get some increase in fitness, right? So there is a covariance, they co-vary with each other fit, between fitness and, or between the trait value and fitness, right? That's what covariance means, okay? So, there are some interesting mathematical identities between means and covariances, right? And it turns out a covariance between, and we'll, we'll use these terms, between fitness and a trait is equal to the product of the mean plus the mean plus the products of two means, okay? That's the definition of covariance. It is the covariance between fitness and a trait is equal to the mean product multiplied by the product of two means. Notice that we have a mean product in both of our terms here. So we can actually rewrite these terms as covariances between these traits, all right? So that's what we're going to do. Let's rewrite this as this. So what we have here, right, uh, to, to rewrite this around, notice that we're going to have to do a little rearranging, is equal to the covariance between w phi, right, plus that. 
Right, so that's the actual form that we have it in here, so we're just going to put these terms and substitute it for this one. All right, so now, equal to 1 on w bar, and then we're going to substitute this out. So we, now we have the covariance between fitness and a trait plus the product of two means plus, we'll just leave this last one unchanged for now. Okay? That's our new expression. Now we should recognize a couple of things pretty quickly here, and that is that we now have mean trait value, or we now have mean fitness in the numerator and in the denominator. Right? It's in both of those, which means that this term disappears. It goes away. It equals, it's equal to 1. Right? So that leaves us solely with the mean trait value in the ancestral generation. Remember what we have over here on the other side of the, uh, of the equal sign. I'm just going to put it here so that we can see it. Right? What we have on the other side is the change, or, or is the um, mean trait value and the descendant generation. So we now have this value here, this value here, and we want to get to this change. All we need to do then is subtract this value from the other side. Right? So if we subtract this out, so we subtract that from that side, then we do the same thing here, we subtract it from this side, and then we can rewrite this as simply delta bar, we're going to get rid of this, rewrite this here, plus w delta bar, like that. And this, ladies and gentlemen, this expression here is known as the price theorem. That is the price theorem. This has been referred to as the fundamental theorem of evolution. Now, what I want to do is just kind of briefly explain in words what this represents and why this form is so important. Right? In this form, a lot of the things that we're going to talk about in just a moment are a little obscure. Right? They're, they're not made very clear if you're thinking about this change in this form. But it, from this form, suddenly we get a lot of interesting uh, in, we can get a lot of interesting insights about evolution from this form here. What are they? Firstly. This covariance term, okay, this covariance term is a very, very fascinating term that equals, uh, that is going to equal natural selection and genetic drift. Both of those key processes of evolution are captured in this covariance term. How can that be? How does that make sense? So, imagine if you have some trait, right? And for every increase in that trait value, you get an increase in fitness, right? And that is because that trait makes you better in your environment for whatever reason. It makes you be uh, better able to find mates, better able to survive, better able to forage, forage for food, whatever it might be. Right? If there's a causal link between these two things, that's natural selection. If, however, there's no causal link, if these are two random variables that are covarying just randomly with each other, without a causal link, that's genetic drift. So the price theorem is telling us something very, very important, and that is the two processes of evolution that are responsible for removing variation from populations are captured in this first term. That's pretty incredible, right? Now, what are the mechanisms that are important for adding variation back into populations? That is captured in this term. Remember, this term represents the deviation between ancestors and descendants. So, this captures mutation and recombination. These two things are in this part of the price theorem. Therefore, the price theorem captures four fundamental forces of evolution, natural selection, genetic drift, 
mutation, and recombination. Right? Now, there's also gene flow, which you can expand the Price theorem to include gene flow as well, but for simplicity's sake, we are just showing these four forces. Now, again, we got to this point without making a single simplifying assumption. We simplified nothing, right? We made no assumptions. We started off with our simple diagram, we wrote that diagram mathematically, and then we derived this expression from it, okay? No simplifying assumptions. What I want to show you now is that we can start from this point, from the Price Theorem, and get Fisher's Fundamental Theorem without making a single simplifying assumption, okay? And that is what we're going to do next. Okay, real quick correction before we go on, I just noticed this. This should actually be minus. So please bear that in mind. This should have been minus, and then this makes sense. Just a real quick correction there. Okay, um, with that being said, now I'm going to show you how we can derive Fisher's Fundamental Theorem from the price equation. So uh, now we're just going to rewrite the price equation up here. So it is delta phi bar equals to 1 on w bar multiplied by the covariance between w phi plus uh, w delta bar. Okay, there's the price equation. And now what we're going to do is we're going to derive Fisher's theorem straight from it. So, what uh, to do this, let's write down Fisher's theorem so that we can remember what it is. Uh, so remember, Fisher's theorem is the change in mean population fitness as equal to the additive genetic variance uh, divided by mean fitness plus some deviation. Okay, so can we get to that from this? All right, what we need to do then, one of the things we need to remember is that this trait, this phi, can be anything. Remember we said it can be an allele, it can be a genotype, it can be a phenotype, any kind of complex trait we want, it can even be fitness itself. If fitness is a heritable trait, such that parents are passing on some component of their fitness, then we can just represent phi as fitness itself. Okay? So, what we then need to do is we need to just distinguish between fitness terms. So, let's rewrite the price equation by letting the phenotype be equal to fitness. So then we just have the change in mean fitness here equals to 1 on w bar multiplied by the covariance between, now we're going to add in an extra term, w i w j. Alright, remember we showed before that i is for the ancestor, j is for the descendant. That's now we're going to distinguish them plus, again, W and then delta bar, okay? So now we've just rewritten the price equation with, by replacing the phi terms with fitness itself. Okay, let's make some room over here. Okay, now um, let's actually expand this term out and make it a little bit simple like we did previously. Remember, this is simply equal to covariance between fitness and delta bar plus the product of two means. So let's just rewrite this term here. Uh, we'll just rewrite it down here. So let's say this is w bar multiplied by the covariance between w sub i and w sub j plus the covariance between W and, and delta bar plus the product of W and delta bar. Okay, there we go. Now, recognize again that you have a W bar in each of these, right? Which means we can just get rid of the W bar there. It cancels out. That just leaves us with delta. Now we can just add these two terms, recognize that this is actually I, right? This is a, the ancestor fitness here. So we can add these two terms together, and what that gives us 
is W sub bar multiplied by the covariance between W sub I and W sub J plus delta plus mean delta. Okay, now we've just put those terms together. Now, the next thing that we need to do is we're just going to simplify this by uh, calling it W sub O, so this is the fitness of offspring, or fitness of descendants, and let's just let it be equal to W sub J plus delta, right? And all that's doing is we're just defining a new variable here as being equal to this, and this is just going to allow us to write this a little bit more simply. So now let's just replace this with W sub O, and now we don't need that. That allows us to just write it like that. Again, we've not done anything, we've not done any simplification, we're just writing it a little bit differently. So now we can get it back into this kind of term, back into this sort of format, right? Um, so now we have the covariance between ancestor and descendant plus some mean deviation. So notice we are really close to this. But how do we get from this covariance term to this additive genetic variance term? To do that, we need to learn a little bit more about what covariances are. Okay? We need to learn a little bit more about what those are. I'm going to make us some room to do that. I'm going to erase, actually I'm going to erase all this and rewrite it up here just so that we have a little bit, a little bit more room. So, I'm going to write what we just did. So, right now, we are sitting at this expression, covariance between W, W, O plus mean delta. That's where we're at right now. That's what we've just derived. Now, let's learn a little bit more about this covariance term. Okay? To get this, and to relate it to what we call this additive genetic variance, we need to know what else covariances are equal to. And to do this, we need to learn about what's called a linear regression, specifically a least squares linear regression. So, let's draw this out here, and let's put um, ancestor fitness and descendant fitness. So, on the X, ancestor fitness, on the Y, is descendant fitness. And let's say there is some values that look like that. That's what our, what our distribution of traits look like, okay? A linear regression, if we performed a linear regression on this, what we are doing is we are fitting a straight line through these points such that it minimizes the distance between the points and the line itself. So that might look, and forgive me for being unable to draw a straight line, that might look something like that. Okay? That is our linear regression. And then between each of these points, there is some distance between those points and the line itself, both like that. Okay. Now, the slope of this line is what we call the beta regression coefficient. Beta regression coefficient is equal to the slope of that line. Okay? So, what does all this have to do with covariance? Well, remember, as we defined covariance before, right, it's the, it's the covariation. As you increase one trait, you increase the other, or as you decrease one, you decrease the other, right? There's, there's some covariation between these traits, and we see that there's clearly a relationship going on here, right? So, what is the covariance? How can we define, or how can we relate these things? Well, it turns out that this slope, this beta regression coefficient, we'll write it over here, the beta regression coefficient is equal to the covariance between these two divided by the variance in that one. Where the variance is a measure of the spread of points around the mean. 
So let's say this is, let's say this is the mean, right? This spread here is the variance, okay? So this slope, this beta regression coefficient, is simply equal to the ratio of the covariance to the variance, all right? Now, where does additive come in here? So additive in this context simply means it's a straight line, right? It's, an, it's a linear slope. It's an additive slope, right? Now, this is really important uh, because there's often a lot of confusion about what we mean when we say the additive variance. It does not mean that the trait itself has to be additive. That's not what it means at all. It simply means that the slope we fit to it is an additive slope. This trait could be anything, right? So for example, let's say instead of it, like I kind of drew it as if it was additive, but let's say I drew it, and we're gonna, we're gonna try to make these equivalent. Let's say I drew it where it looked like that. This is clearly not additive, right? But, and again, hypothetically, the slope would still be linear, right? And these two slopes could be equal to each other, right? I've tried to draw them in such a way as if the slopes are the same, but they may not be exactly the same. But notice that this is clearly not a strictly additive trait, and yet the slopes can be equivalent to one another. Hence, we are still capturing the additive variance. All of the distance between these, where you're no longer falling along this red line, so we've got basically two variances here, right? There is the additive variance, and that is captured by the beta regression coefficient. Right? It's just the slope. Right? All the other variances, Every, all the things that are falling off of that line, hence the, well, well actually, we've shown it up here, these black, um, these black lines that I've drawn here are what are called the residual variances. Residual variance. And the residual variance is equal to dominance plus epistasis. So the other two types of genetic architecture, dominance and epistasis, are captured in the distances between the points and an additive slope. Right? How large those are, so like in this case, those are very large, right? So like from this point here to here, that's a very large variance separating those, right? So while the additive variance between these may be exactly the same, the residual variances are different, okay? Residual variances are different. But remember, what, does, what is the natural selection term? It's a covariance, right? And this particular, and covariance is equal to the additive line, not to the residual variance, but to the additive variance, okay? Hopefully that's starting to come together a little bit here is that natural selection actually, when it's acting on means, doesn't care about this variance. Doesn't care about it. It only cares about the additive variance because that's what's being captured by the slope, irrespective of the actual underlying architecture. Okay. Now we can talk about selection acting on these variances, right? Um, and these actually are acting on higher moments of the variance, but uh, we're not, we're not going to get into that. that, that gets, that's going to get too far into the weeds. For our purpose, all we need to know is that selection, because it's equal to this covariance, only cares about this additive component. Okay? Alright, so hopefully that shows you the connection here. Now when we say additive genetic variance, what we mean by genetic in this context is simply heritable. Okay. When all of these concepts were first derived, it was long before we knew about genes in like the DNA sense. Okay. When they said genetic in 1910 and 1920, all they meant is that it was heritable. 
So, the additive genetic variance then is simply the component of the relationship between these two terms that are captured by the beta regression coefficient and are passed on to the next generation. Hopefully, that ties together some of these concepts. Um, so, I'm going to now erase this. Now that we know a bit about what these things represent, we can actually rewrite this term given this relationship. Right? So, now, mean change in fitness is equal to the beta regression multiplied by the variance in W plus some deviation. Right? Now, let's just put this on top. And we can keep this out as represented by just a, a simple fraction. So we can say W bar is equal to the beta regression multiplied by the variance divided by W bar plus some deviation. Now we're pretty close, right? So what is V sub A? Remember what we said, V sub A this is simply the way quantitative geneticists have classically written additive genetic variance. Right? V sub A is additive genetic variance. As we just explained, additive genetic variance, V sub A, turns out to be equal to the beta regression coefficient multiplied by the variance. That's what additive genetic variance means in the quantitative genetic framework. Hence, this term, turns out, is simply equal to V sub A, and so we can just rewrite this as V sub A over W bar. And folks, now, we have connected, those are now equivalent. Right? Hence, we have now derived Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural selection straight from the price theorem. We have made no simplifying assumptions. Everything that we've shown here are identities. Right? We've just rewritten terms based on known mathematical identities between them. Hence, Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural selection can be straightforwardly derived with no further assumptions from the Price Theorem. Because of this, and because the Price Theorem itself, as we showed before, made no simplifying assumptions, none whatsoever, it was just a mathematical representation of the diagram that we think is like represents the way evolution works, right? Since we can get Fisher's theorem from that, then it makes no simplifying assumptions and is indeed a general theorem of nature. Now again, as we stated before, if we want to, be, to focus only on the component of the change of fitness that is due to natural selection, then we just let this term be equal to zero, right? If that is equal to zero, then, all, then what we're left with is the traditional way of showing Fisher's theorem, which is just this. Right. And that is, in words, the change in the mean population fitness is equal to the additive genetic variance in fitness at that time. With that, we have now shown that Fisher's fundamental theorem is indeed a general theorem, as it can be straightforwardly derived from the price equation. Hopefully, that clarifies for you the math that we did in the first part of the paper. Um, and, I, I hope, shows that Basinger and Sanford are dead wrong, that Fisher's theorem has many simplifying assumptions, um, that, as they state, limit its generality and its applicability in natural systems. That, in fact, Fisher's theorem is incredibly general, and applies to any evolving population. 
Um, I hope that we've made this clear by specifically clarifying what this additive genetic variance is. This is, the, this is, I think, the sticking point that most people don't really understand very well. That by additive genetic variance, we are just talking about this beta regression coefficient, right? That is a linear regression by least squares. Um, and, this, and this discovery is actually pretty fascinating. Right, uh, R.A. Fisher made this discovery that natural selection only cares, like when natural selection is acting on mean trait values, it only cares about the additive variance, right? uh, which, is, which is just absolutely fascinating. Um, the geneticist James Crow once remarked on this, uh, stating that nature discovered least squares long before Gauss did. Right? This is a pretty fascinating fact, right? um, that nature itself acts as a linear regression. Um, okay, so, yeah, uh, that's, that's the math. That's what I wanted to kind of get across to you today. Hopefully this was helpful. Um, if you're stuck anywhere, if you, if you see any mistakes that I made, please note them in the comments below. I, try, I did all of this kind of uh, off of the top of my head because I wanted it to feel organic. So if, if you noticed any mistakes anywhere that I made, please point them out. Um, and, yeah, thanks so much for being here. If you have any questions... Drop them in the comments, and I will see you all on April 24th for a full review of the paper uh, over on Dan's channel at Creation Myths, and I'll catch you later.